Hello. Thank you. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Welch. Thank you. It is so good to be here with you today. Hello, Springfield. Yes. Oh, better yet, hello, Stick. Right? Good to be here. This is my second time here, uh, actually, at Stick. Uh, I want to say a very big thank you for the introduction to Senator Welsh. Thank you, Jim. He's right. He was one of my very early supporters. Back when people were still saying, really? Uh, you're going to do that? He was, he was in on this. So I thought what we'd do today is that I would talk for just a little bit about kind of how I see what's happening right now in Washington. And then we'll take as many questions as we've got time for. And then if anybody wants to, we can stay afterwards and do pictures. And uh, that's the fun part, right? Uh, uh, th that, that counts as the party favors, OK, for doing this. Um, and also, uh, after you leave, um, you will get an email from us so that if you want to stay in touch, you'll be able to know how to do that. See, there's one of them right now. Uh, OK, all right. Um, so I want to talk about actually what I think is happening in the country right now. You know, there are a lot of issues we can talk about, and I will talk about it. I'll talk about any issue you all want to. But the principal one that's just kind of right at the core that people don't talk so much about is what's happening to democracy in this country. Right now, the Republicans are just hacking away at the foundations of democracy. And frankly, it's been going on since before Donald Trump got elected. But now that Donald Trump is in there, it's like it's accelerated. And, and I just want to mention three parts to it and why it matters so much. You know, we kind of rely on core pieces of how democracy works to say, no matter how much things get out of whack in this country, you count on some things to bring it back. And the first one is voting. And frankly, the Republicans have been on the attack against voting for about 20 years now. Uh, and you've seen it over and over and over. Voting suppression, uh, uh, voter ID laws designed to keep people from getting to the polls, gerrymandering, that means that your vote doesn't count as much. And uh, now, Russian interference in our electoral system. That is an attack on the United States of America. And we need to respond. And yet, the Trump administration nah, didn't even happen, continues to deny that it happened. So we're dealing with attacks on voting. A major political party in America that now says pretty openly that its plan to get elected and reelected is to keep American citizens from voting at least those American citizens who might vote for the other party. I think that's pretty deeply shocking. The second one is an attack on an independent judiciary. You know, we've counted for a long, long time on the fact that we get those federal judges in. They have to be confirmed. They need support from both parties, used to, in the Senate. And OK, there might be some differences between who Mitt Romney would have named and who Barack Obama named. But I'm telling you, this thing has just gone completely off the rails now, where we're talking about people who, frankly, because of their past statements, are disqualified to be federal judges. Because they have said things, they have written things that make it clear they cannot be independent. And we now have in America a stolen Supreme Court seat, something that was just taken away from the people of the United States. And the third thing that I've really worried about on this is an attack on the free press. That it has been just one after another after another. And you know, look, I spent most of my life as a professor, as a teacher. I never thought the word fact would need a modifier. <laughs> I thought it was just like fact, right? And now it's, what do you say, facty facts as opposed to fake facts, fake news, right? And think about this for a second. A president of the United States who says to one segment of America, listen only to me, 
only listen to this news source because they will tell it the way I want it told. Don't even listen, because that is what he's saying. Don't even listen to anyone else. And then he turns around to the rest of America, to the rest of those news programs, and goes on the attack after them. Goes on the attack after the companies that own them, goes on the attack after reporters that represent them. So I'm worried. These are foundational pieces in democracy. We lose those foundational pieces, we got real trouble in this country. And yet, I'm here today because I am fundamentally optimistic. So let me tell you why. Um, it's not gonna start in a good place. I went, <laughs> but it'll get to a good place. So hang in there with me. Um, I went to see Donald Trump sworn in. I went to the inauguration. Uh, and I know some people didn't, but I, I actually went to see it. And I was not as far as probably from here to the front row when he was sworn in. And it, was, it, it is now burned into the back of my eyeballs. <laughs> And it turns out that's a really good thing. If I ever get tired, I ever get a little discouraged, I ever think, yeah, let's go do something else, I lay back, I close my eyes, I see Donald Trump being sworn in as President of the United States, and I say, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> let's go. I'm in this fight. I'm ready. All the way. So, it was a pretty grim day for me, the day that Donald Trump was sworn in. And I got on a plane that night and I flew back to Massachusetts and I'm thinking, they own it all. They got the House, they got the Senate, they got the White House. I, I figured they'd repeal the Affordable Care Act within a week. That they're gonna run the tables doing whatever they wanna do. Our only chance is a people's army, is people who raise their voices and say, I will have my voice heard in Washington. And I'm thinking, where is a people's army going to come from? How do we do this? How do we raise this? And the next morning, I'm driving in. I went into Boston the next morning. Uh, uh, and I'm going toward the common. And I'm watching all these people as they're walking in the next morning. Women in their pink pussy hats. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, guys pushing baby strollers. Very good look, I got to say. It's a very, very handsome look. Um, little kids, singles, groups, mamas and grandmamas, all kinds of folks coming in. And, and I'm thinking, wow, look at all these people as they're coming in. And I see this little girl. She's got her sign. She's on her daddy's shoulders. And she has her own handmade sign. I know it is her sign and that she made it because it had about four pounds of glitter on it. <laughs> her sign says, I fight like a girl. And I thought, me too, sweetie. We're in this. But that's the deal. That's the deal. On that day, the biggest protest rally in the history of the world took place. That's extraordinary. Anyone want to hear a march? Extraordinary. And here's the deal. They marched in Washington, yeah, and they marched in Boston, and they marched in San Francisco, and they marched in LA. They marched all over Western Massachusetts, and they marched in Wichita, Kansas, and they marched in Enid, Oklahoma, and they marched around the world. And who organized that march? How did it get started? It wasn't a bunch of officials, people at the top who said, hey, I think we better call people together for a march. It was a bunch of folks, many of them who'd never been very actively involved in politics, who said, we're going to get together and we're going to make sure our voices get heard. And that is when democracy in America began to change, on that day with that march. And then, that's the best part. Democracy just kept rewiring itself. The scientists said, we're going to do our march because we can do even cooler signs, right? <laughs> Beer, brought to you by science. <laughs> that was one of my favorites. Uh, no plagues, science, thank you. Um, but uh, so we had more marches. We had more rallies. We had rallies for health care. And here's the deal. It went beyond rallies. 
I was down in Washington last spring and last summer as we were still debating health care because enough people had spoken out they had not been able to repeal it in the first weeks. Remember, repeal and replace? And then they had to come forward. They put out a plan, then they back off from that plan, put out another plan. Why? Because people were speaking up. I went, I was down in Washington, and you'd walk out in the hallways. When you go to vote, you have to. You have no choice. You have to go from your Senate office over to the Capitol in order in person to cast your vote. And I watched these mamas who had come to Washington, the mothers of babies with complex medical needs. And there they were, pushing those strollers, and some of them actually tugging along wagons that had oxygen tanks and feeding apparatus and emergency equipment. And I watched them get right in the faces of Republican senators and say, you want to vote to get rid of Medicaid? That's the face of Medicaid. My baby depends on Medicaid. So you better remember when you go in to vote, there are real live human beings whose lives are at stake. Those mamas helped us turn the tide and help save medical care for millions of people across this country. You bet they did. And now, we've seen a school shooting, another and another and another. But down in Florida, what do we watch? We watch the 15-year-olds, the 16-year-olds, the 17-year-olds who say, we're going to make sure our voices get heard. If the grown-ups can't do it, we'll do it. And for me, that's the deal. This is why my heart is filled with hope. I get it. The Republicans, Donald Trump, they're just hacking away. They're trying to keep people from voting. They're trying to own the judiciary. They're trying to shut down a free and independent press. But at the very same moment, all across this country, people are raising their voices. People are standing up and saying, I will be heard. And I got to tell you, it is an exciting time to be in this fight. Because when I go down to Washington and fight, I know I'm not alone. I'm fighting for the people of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Have we got a... Have we got a moderator to come out? Hello? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> come on out. Hey, hey Carlos! Hey. Well, man, how you doing? <laughs> Good to see you. You want to you moderate? I, 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 I was you got the deal? All right, here we go. Thank you, Senator. Mi casa es su casa. <laughs> Welcome bet. to Springfield, Massachusetts once again. Good to be here. Yeah. So right here at Stick. You know, yeah. Let me just also acknowledge that came in uh, with me, uh, Representative Jose Tosado is oh. with us today. Good to see you. And uh, my city council, Adam Gomez, is here also with us today. So I'm okay, supposed so you to. you want to explain to people how this works? Okay. Uh, I think uh, President uh, Ramos explained the process. I am supposed to select uh, three numbers. Make I am going to read them. Ones. And the, uh, excuse me? Four numbers? Okay. okay. Four numbers. Pick four numbers. I'm going to read the last three numbers. And the first one will read the first question, and the fourth one will read the fourth. Okay. And we have people with microphones. Is that and right? Left and the right. The aisles here. Okay. First number, 890. That's Second just the number, last three. Uh -huh. 904. Anybody? Zero, I'm um, 862. And the fourth number is 854. So 890, 904, 862, and 854. All right, we got some folks ready. We have some folks. All right, this is going to be fun. <laughs> you bet it is. All right, 
Hi, I'm Andrew from Grafton. Can you please set up a Worcester office? It's a hell of a schlep Hello, here. Andrew. Yeah. Anyway, I read an interesting piece in the New York Times, who are not failing, by the way. Uh-huh. Uh, and it was an op-ed piece uh, that uh, said, suggested lowering the voting age to 16. I mean, these kids from Parkland, they are getting involved in every way they can. And yes, they we're are. not letting them have an actual say in the ballot. I mean, mm -hmm. as soon as I turned 18, I voted every two years. And I'm going to vote for you, for my representative, Jim McGovern. Yay! <laughs> come November. Thank you. And I think we should give these kids a say. We should let them fill out a ballot. So that's a really interesting idea. You know, I, can I add two things to it? Because I'm open to this. But I want to add a couple of things to it. I think the first responsibility, and this is something that happens at the state level that we all ought to be doing, is we ought to be taking every single step possible that increases voter turnout. And yeah, we've done a lot of them. We had a lot of voting reforms in Massachusetts a couple of years ago. But one we did not do is same day registration. And it is proven to help bring up uh, voter participation. And I just, I think it's just nuts that we don't do that. The second thing that I think we ought to be doing on voting is we frankly ought to just make it easier to vote. And here's what I'm worried about when I talked about the Russian part of this. I am really worried that with the Russians, we know from our intelligence agencies, all of them, uniformly, have told us that the Russians hacked in to our electoral systems in order to influence the outcome of the election. And what I worry about right now is that we must not only maintain and extend the integrity of the electoral system, I mean that your vote actually gets counted, but also that we all believe that. Because it can't be the case that we shift over. And a lot of people say, you know, the Russians are in there. It's all going to be manipulated by computer and by bots. There's no point in showing up. We need everybody to show up. My view is when everybody shows up and votes, democracy wins. And that's what we got to do. So I like your idea. Let's work on it. OK, good. What else can we do? Uh, hello, I'm uh, Tom Charlo from East Longmeadow. Hello, Tom. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you thank for everything you. that you do. Thank you. Um, so my question is, um, so ever since the GOP and the person in the White House passed the tax bill. You don't want to say his name, do you? No, I refuse. <laughs> um, it's OK, I get it. I'm, I get you. Okay, um, go ahead, Tom. So ever since they passed the uh, tax bill um, to the, or tax giveaway, I should say, to the top yeah. 1%, um, we've noticed that a lot of middle class Americans have seen a slight uh, increase in their paycheck. Mm -hmm. So how would you and other Democrats convince those people that this bill is a bad bill? So look, I am always glad to see people's pay go up. I, I think it's a great thing. I am very, very glad to see it. But we really got to take a serious look at this tax bill. And let me just point out the stories that don't seem to make it forward very far. Kimberly Clark, Kimberly Clark, you uh, Pampers. Uh, Kleenex, Huggies, Huggies, not Pampers, Huggies. Huggies and Kleenex are a big company. They read the tax bill and they said, oh, we get it. We don't need to give raises to anyone. What we're going to do now that we understand the way the economy will be reordered from this tax bill is we're just going to lay off 5,000 Americans. Done. And so what, what troubles me here is that the perception and the reality don't always stay in alignment. But what troubles me even more is that when the Republicans decided that they were going to push through a tax bill, I want you to think for just a second about how this worked. They went behind closed doors. And the only people who were allowed to see it were the Republican legislators themselves, the lobbyists, and the donors. And they didn't want a single Democrat in there and, and here's what's interesting. There were some Democrats, not me, but there were some Democrats who said, in effect, publicly said, I'm gettable. Do something for my home state, and you could turn this 
potentially into a bipartisan bill. And the Republicans said, nope, door's locked. Think about why. Here's, my, here's what I think is going on. When they're delivering a trillion and a half dollars in giveaways to their big donors, they want to make sure that the big donors know. It wasn't bipartisan. It was Republicans all the way. And that's at the heart of what this tax bill is about. Just yesterday, Paul Ryan said, you know, now that the tax bill has gone through, we're going to have to find some places to make some cuts, to change the, right? And you want to know what his first suggestion was? Time to take a look at Medicare. So it's both halves in this tax bill. It's both the giveaway to a handful of giant corporations and billionaires, but it's the fact that the ultimate payment is going to come due for working families. And that's going to show up in Medicare. It's going to show up in the fact somebody has to pay to keep the military in the field, to keep the Food and Drug Administration running tests, to pave the roads, to keep the schools open. And what this tax bill was all about is it won't be the richest and the most powerful paying their fair share. It's about dumping it on hardworking families that are already shouldering too much. So we need to be out there talking about this tax bill every single day, talking about who really benefited from it and talking about who's really going to pay the price. If you need a reason to try to get Democrats back in power, it's to try to make the adjustments, once again, that level the playing field and say everybody pays a fair share. Billionaires don't get to walk out of here and leave everyone else stuck with the bill. So that's how I see this. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Tom. Mm -hmm. Who else have we got? Hi, I'm Dave from Long Meadow. OK. I wanted, is it OK if I ask you a question about 2020? I know our focus is 2018. But is that OK? Dave, you got the mic. OK. But, but I can tell you the I'm answer, not... no. <laughs> I'm not voting for him either. Okay. Uh, All right. <laughs> uh, my concern is where a candidate might come from. If we compare this back to 2002, before the 2004 election, uh -huh. it was pretty clear that who some of the major candidates were. Uh -huh. I don't see that this time, two years out from the election. I just don't see gelling around certain people. And I, people have said, who's going to be the candidate? I, said, I okay. have the slightest idea. Thank you. <laughs> So Dave, I actually want to make a pitch to you. And that is that maybe that's a good thing. And, and let me describe why. Um, two parts. First is that we cannot be a party that says everything exciting happens once every four years. We now have to be a party. And frankly, we have to be a democracy that says you got to show up every day and be in the fight every day. Every day, every election. Right this minute, we are involved in intense fights in Washington. Look, I hope somebody else will ask me about it. I'll do more. But the, the bank lobbyists want the Senate to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the biggest crash since the Great Depression by rolling back regulations on some of the biggest Wall Street banks. This isn't, yeah, boo, you bet. <laughs> My kind of gal, right? Boo. <laughs> but this is an intense fight right now. We can't be looking past these. We, got, we have so little to fight with. The Republicans own the House. The Republicans own the Senate. They own the White House. We have got to stay in these fights right now. And 2018 needs to be our focus. We got to take back the House and the Senate in 2018. Yes. We do that, the world starts to look different right after November of 2018. So let's hang in there. Let's take back next House and number. Senate. OK? You good, Dave? All right. The next, next group of numbers are 854, 854. After that is 900, 900, and then 874, 874, and 896, 896. 
Okay, who we got? Whichever mic is closer to you, please. Yeah. They both work. We've tested them out now. Over here. I'm Fred Rosenberg. I'm from Longmeadow, Massachusetts. Where are you, Fred? I, I'm, I'm right right sorry, I'm under the light. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it, I see it's Fred. It's kind of anticlimactic to see me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I like the beard. Nice, uh, nice. Thank you. Nice. It, it, it kind of glows in the dark because it's white. Um, I'd like to thank you and Actually, everybody. It really in the, does. You're not kidding. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm painfully aware of that. Um, <laughs> I, I'd like to thank you and everyone in the office, first of all, for the wonderful work you're doing. Thank My, you. Thank you. When, when you say the office, what you're really talking about is Everett and the two Jessicas who've just done wonderful work. We love them. We love them. And, and all the people who answer the phone when yep. I call. Thank you. Um, my question is, uh, my major concern right now is net neutrality. Because yes. if we lose net neutrality, um, every time you look up anything, you can get, say, Fox News or whatever they decide they wish to show you. Um, it looks like it's really in the balance. What can we do to tip the balance and get net neutrality uh, back in the picture? And also for the states like, say, Washington, which are trying to exercise uh, states' rights and say, okay, we require net neutrality in our state, what do we do? What's yeah, our battle plan? Great. So let me just make sure everybody is up to speed, no pun intended, on net neutrality. <laughs> so basically what this is about is this is about kind of like access to basic infrastructure. If you want access to the internet, um, are you gonna be able to get out there and get access just like giant corporations? Or are we gonna build a kind of two-tier system where some people are gonna be on the super highway of information, moves very fast, everything downloads quickly, and some people are gonna be on dirt roads. That, that, that's the difference. And why does this matter? Okay, it matters when you're downloading those cat videos. Okay, nobody will admit that they download cat videos. Yes, you do. Okay, but here's what it matters for particularly. Small businesses that are, that are trying to get a foot in the door, uh, that are trying to build up, that are trying to sell online. If they're on the dirt roads, if they don't have access at the same rates as the ones who can pay a whole lot more, the Amazons and the big corporations, then this will stamp out competition right from the get-go. So think of it this way. Suppose that some people got electricity all the time and some people just got it from time to time. It's pretty, you know, like Puerto Rico. The, I mean, the oh. horrible, no, I'm serious. How do you build an economy going forward when that's happening? You can't do it. You can't build a 21st century economy. So net neutrality, what happened is during the Obama administration, the FCC had taken the steps and basically declared this is gonna be like a utility. Everybody gets the same kind of access. You pay, you get access. And you don't have differential pricing like this. Now what's happened is Donald Trump becomes president. He uh, names to the head of the FCC, Chairman Pai, and he wants to roll that back. We have 60 days from when the rule rolling it back first became official, and I've lost a little bit of track of time. I want to say it's about 10 days ago. We've got about 50 days left to be able to roll back the rule that ends net neutrality, that is to go back to net neutrality. And all it takes is a simple majority in the United States Congress to make that happen. Um, we have been reaching out to Republicans, we've got all the Democrats, I think, on our side on this, and now there are 49 Democrats. So we think we've got some Republicans on this, but we've got to get a vote. And that means we've got to talk Mitch McConnell into letting us have a vote to be able to roll back the rule. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it goes back to the same point once again, over and over and over. Those who already have money and power, they'd be really happy to roll back net neutrality because they can afford the superhighway and they would like to cut out that upstart competition that gets in the way and that challenges them. So net neutrality is something 
that works for the people. And so this is going to be one more example of when we've got to keep raising our voices. We've got to keep sending those emails in. We've got to keep signing the petitions, every possible way to put the pressure on. Right now, we've been working. Ed Markey has just been terrific on helping the lead on this. Let's give Ed Markey a good man on this. We're trying to get it going in the Senate. We need to see this going in the House, but we need to be able to roll back this rule. So I'm there with you all the way, but it's going to take a lot of voices to make this happen. It's a really good point. I'm glad you raised it. Thank you. Thank Next you. question. Good. Thank you. OK. Over here, to the right. Hi, I'm Terry from Belchertown. OK, good to see you, Terry. Hi. Thank you again for all your work that you do oh, thank um, you. locally and on the national level. Um, I am a nursing faculty here at STCC, and I work at a local emergency room. And my concern has to do with the health care of what's going on in locally and then nationwide. Um, our patients are sicker. Mm -hmm. um, no matter where we are, <clears throat> excuse me, in the acute care setting, hospital setting, in our psychiatric facilities, in our long-term care settings. And the, it seems like the insurance companies have m mandated how long patients stay, how quickly they get out of their, our facility without us really caring for them as well as we need to. And then they're shoved into so many different areas that patients end up coming back and getting more care. Um, how can we um, navigate to the next level and maybe stop getting insurance companies to tell us in the healthcare field how to do our job? Okay, so thank you, Terry. Thank you. So let me just start about the difference between Republicans and Democrats, because I think sometimes we just have to call this out. Republicans think it's just fine to knock 35 million people off their health care coverage and to start attacking Medicare. Democrats believe that health care is a basic human right and we fight for basic human rights, period. So let's talk about what we can be doing in Washington. And I, I, wanna, I wanna build this, okay, in three different places right now if I can very quickly. The first one is Medicare for all. I think we've got to be in that fight all the way. And it's going to be a fight. It's not going to happen while the Republicans are in control. It's going to be a fight, but it's a fight worth having. The second thing, though, I want to talk about is I've got a, a new bill out that says a big part of most of the approaches to Medicare for all, Medicaid for all, different ways to get universal coverage rely in part, or at least for a period of time, on private health insurance. And you all know my background. It's basically consumer protection. And I've done a lot of this in financial services, credit cards, mortgages, payday loans. We need basic consumer protections in the insurance industry. <laughs> Just basic stuff. You know, this business that they can take, your, take a doctor out of network in the middle of the year, so all of a sudden, you discover those last three visits weren't covered. Or that they can change which prescriptions are covered. It just goes on and on. Oh, sorry, that wasn't covered, even though we told you it was. I'm just talking basic consumer protection. So I've got a bill on basic consumer protection. Senator Markey has co-sponsored this with me. We're getting other people on board. But I think this is something we got to fight for. The third part, I just want to say again to all of you, and I'm going to keep saying this in different iterations, it's so important to keep the heat up in this fire. We, we did it. We were there last summer. I stood there on the floor of the United States. I stood there at Ted Kennedy's desk, and I will always think of it as Ted Kennedy's desk because he wrote his name in the drawer. Uh, <laughs> he did. Uh, it also has his brother John's name in the drawer. Uh, yeah, I'm really proud to have that desk. And I, I stood there when the health care vote was in the Senate. Remember health, the repeal of the Affordable Care Act, uh, the rollback of basic Medicaid. Medicaid, two out of every three people in nursing homes 
counts on Medicaid to be able to stay in the nursing home, and they were going to roll all of it back. We knew, standing there in the Senate that night, that we had all 48, that's how many we had then, 48 Democrats, and we knew we had to get three. 50 wouldn't do it, because Mike Pence was there to break the tie and would go for the repeal. And I stood there while, first, Susan Collins voted no. You say, we're at 49. Lisa Murkowski voted no, we're at 50. You look around, where's John McCain? He was out in the cloakroom. The vice president had pulled him out, and you're thinking, this is not good. And John McCain walks back in, and you just, what's he going to do? And he stands there and does this. And we saved health care for 25 million Americans. But the reason that happened, razor thin, but the reason it happened was because people all over this country, people who'd never been political before, people who'd never been engaged before, made their voices heard. People sent emails, people protested, people made phone calls. This is what it means to raise your voice. And I get it. The Republicans came back again. They, in effect, are going to knock about 13 million people off health care with this tax uh, law that they passed. But the point is, we've got to stay on health care. People's lives are depending on it. So I'm counting on all of you. We've got to do this. We've got okay. to do this. Okay. Let's get to the next numbers, 874-896-902. Okay. 874. And I'm, I want to get the other ones up, too. Oh. Okay. Um, uh, my name is Heida Martinez, and I hope I don't get emotional about this, but okay. more than a question, I want to thank you. Uh, you came to us as Puerto Ricans um, as soon as the storm um, hit Puerto Rico and we were still not able to hear from our families. Um, and I have to thank you because you have kept your words. You asked us what you want us to do, you to do for us. Uh, we told you and you have kept our, your word. Thank you. Also, you have kept us informed of all that you have been doing. Thank you so much. And my question now is, what do you want me to do for you? Oh. So kind of you, and so kind of you to put it that way. Let's just talk about Puerto Rico for a minute. Do you realize we're almost six months since the hurricanes hit? And still, it appears that somewhere around a quarter of the island residents do not have reliable electricity. I, these, these are our fellow citizens, American citizens, and our fellow human beings. I, I, led a, a trip, our whole delegation, uh, went to Puerto Rico and, and did it in part because I wanted to see it firsthand and so did others. Uh, Richie Neal was with me. He was terrific the entire time. We had the rest of the delegation. Partly I wanted to see it firsthand, but partly I just wanted to raise the issue again to make sure that people are paying attention. Our government has been too slow has done too little and has been too quick to say that's done and turn their backs and try to go home. And my job, I just was on FEMA again this week uh, to stay after them on basic services. You know, I'll tell you one of the things that was so frustrating when we were there. Sit down with the officials and I said, how many people on the island have drinkable water? And they said 100%. And I said, OK. I said, this is in January. I said, 100%. Um, and I said, now, I want to make sure we're talking about the same thing, not they get some bottled water. I want to know that when they turn on the taps in the kitchen, they can hold a glass under the water and drink that water safely, 100%. Those were our officials who said that. So we leave that meeting with FEMA officials. We get in the cars. And we drive to a community health center, maybe 45 minutes, maybe an hour outside, Port uh, outside San Juan. We're not even that far out. Go to this community health center, and as I'm walking in the door, I look over. 
and here's a water fountain. And it says in Spanish, do not drink. Water is not drinkable. Water not potable, right? On this sign. And so I said to the people who are running community health center, I said, is that just a problem with that water fountain? And the woman who runs it laughed. She said, we have no drinkable water here at the community health center or anywhere in the tens of thousands of families that this community health center serves. Now, the way I see this is we have a critical moral obligation to Puerto Rico. We have failed in that obligation, and we have got to stay on our officials to come back to this. So you ask me what you can do, and the answer is exactly what you're doing now. Please come to town halls and raise this issue with everyone, not just with me, with other elected officials. Talk to people about this. Talk to people about this in the grocery store. Talk to people about this online. Talk to our government about this. Because we have the resources. The federal government has the resources. They just don't have the will to spend it in Puerto Rico, and we got to make them have the will. That's our job. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next numbers are 902, 917, and 870. 902, 917. Excellent. People are getting up. Hello. Right here. Okay. okay. To, the right. to the right. To oh, the to the right. right. Okay. Yeah. To the right. Hi. To the right. Uh, my name is Mohammed Gabriel. I'm from West Springfield. Uh, I'm also a president of the student body at STCC. So Whoa, I would like to. Oh, Crystal yeah. President! Thank you. I would like to welcome everybody on our campus. It's really great to have you over here. Good to be uh, here. There's a lot, of, a lot of questions to be asked. There's a lot of things to talk about. But I'm just going to try to keep it local. Uh, OK. So one of the things that me and my student government members have been working on lately is uh, advocating for uh, in-state tuition fees for undocumented uh, yes. students. Yep, yep. Uh, we, we, we heard a lot about DACA and the conversation is still going on. There's a lot of DACA receptions. Uh, but I'm talking specifically about undocumented students who are not DACA receptions. So they do not receive uh, financial aid of any form, mm -hmm. uh, but get charged double the price of uh, in-state uh, students. Uh, but just because they don't, they don't have the legal documents here, some of them have been uh, here from a very early age, they went through the public school system, they went through, they graduated high schools in Springfield, but come over here in this campus and get charged double the price. And this happens across the state. So I just want to know, uh, what's your take on that? So thank you, Mr. President, for the question. And <laughs> the real president. gosh, it's nice to be able to say, thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> question that expresses some concern about dreamers. So thank you. Uh, so um, you know the question of how, state, uh, how tuition is set at our, our public universities. It's a state question. And so the state legislature gets to do this uh, rather than the federal government. Um, I think it makes enormous sense. But can I just take your question and make it a little bit bigger and talk about Dreamers and undocumented students overall, just for one sec. Sure. You know, because I think it helps make your case. And if it's helpful, I want you to use it. America made a promise. It made a promise to 800,000 young people. Come out of the shadows, go through vetting, and we will give you a chance to go to school, to get jobs, to join the military, and to be part of the great American dream. We made that promise. And in reliance on that promise, more than 800,000 young people did that. They came out of the shadows. They were fully vetted. They signed up. They told where they were. And they started to participate. And then President Trump, a little over six months ago, just broke that promise. Why? Not not because 
these young people were doing anything wrong. They were doing exactly what we wanted them to do. They were doing what we wanted them to do, not just for themselves and their families, they were doing what we wanted them to do because it makes America a stronger, better place. But he broke that promise and then threw it over to Congress and said to Congress, eh, maybe you guys can fix it. And at the end of the day, in the United States Senate, we could not rake in enough Republicans to beat down a filibuster and move a bill forward to protect 800,000 young people, many of whom have known no other country than the United States of America. I think this is a terrible mistake for our country. I think it's a, I think it's a terrible mistake economically. I could make all of those arguments, but most of all, I think it undercuts our values about the kind of people we are and the kind of country we want to build. So we need to be there for our dreamers and let them have a chance to go to school to take jobs. So I'm in all the way. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Mr. President. I'm going to keep saying it. I like that. We have the two last questions on this side, I've been told. OK. okay. My name is Paul Howes, from, and I'm from Springfield. Hello, Paul. And I uh, petitioned you way back when it was clear that Mitch wasn't going to take a vote for you for the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. I'm, I wonder how I he feels a, about that now. <laughs> no, uh, I got a million questions. Uh -huh. uh, but one of the things is this, um, basically, they're going to be selling off our, our infrastructure. Yeah. You know, I could say the word bears ears and how they proclaimed it was taking it away from bureaucrats in Washington yeah. when that was the people's land. So. Yeah. yeah, exactly this, right. One last thing is the um, this uh, financial thing that's going on is it, it, they're basically unregulating financial markets again. We saw what happened with uh, savings and loans, and we saw in the Bush years, you know, the rating, it's a bust out of financial, you know, <laughs> so. Yeah, deregulate big Wall Street banks. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So can I talk just a little bit about the banking bill just for a minute? Um, so. So why do we have a banking bill going forward in Congress? Why, when there's been another mass shooting, when we think we have a bill that Republicans and Democrats, not all Republicans, but enough, would sign off on a compromise bill that has some sensible gun reform in it, why can we not get it to the floor of the United States Senate for a vote? The answer is because Mitch McConnell said, no, no, it is more important to spend the 10th anniversary of the crash of 2008 rolling back regulations on Wall Street banks. You just, you just can't believe this stuff. So here's what this bill does. I want to tell you three quick things about this bill. The first one is that it takes 25 of the 40 largest banks in America who, as a result of Dodd-Frank, were put on a watch list. So they had extra scrutiny and had to raise higher capital standards and so on. Now understand, they are making ginormous profits. They, they, they are not going broke over these regulations. The fact that we stabilized the economy actually means they are making buckets of money. But it, this bill says 25 of them, 25 of the 40 largest, 25 that collectively took $50 billion in taxpayer bailouts, and nobody went to jail for that. Yeah, those are the ones, we're going to start regulating them as if they were tiny little community banks that couldn't possibly affect the economy. That's part one of that bill. I want to tell you two other quick parts that nobody's been talking about much. There is real lending discrimination still going on in America. And a new study out, 61 cities in America where you can actually look at the data and see that African Americans get charged more than white people for the same loans, same kind of credit, right? Latinos get hit harder or can't get loans at all. But how do we know about these? Because we have forced financial institutions to reveal it through the data. They have to put down. So what was the race of the person who just borrowed the money, and how much did you charge them? And then we can analyze and see what's going on. So what does this bill do? 
says 85% of all banks won't have to report that information. If you've got a problem with discrimination, I know the answer. Hide the data, right? That's the second part. The third part about this bill, home mortgages. Home mortgages. You all remember, home mortgages was basically how the financial services industry blew up the American economy. So we said, coming out of that, basically, look, when people are getting home mortgages, you can't cheat them and trick them on a bunch of stuff. You can't cheat them on things like teaser rate loans and hidden fees and a bunch of junk down in the, in the fine print. OK, that sounds good. And we said, when we wrote Dodd-Frank, when Congress passed it, they said, OK, it's going to apply to bricks and mortar houses, regular houses. It's going to apply to condos and triple deckers. And it's going to apply in trailer parks. It's going to apply to manufactured housing. What this bill says, you still can't cheat people who buy regular housing. You still can't cheat people who buy condos. But you know, we're just going to take those people who buy manufactured housing, who live in trailer parks, we're going to take them off the list and make it a whole lot easier to cheat them. Come on. You know? And ultimately, ultimately, when you try to build a business on scamming people, we all know what happens. It goes up, it goes up, it goes up, and then it crashes, and the American taxpayer is left holding the bag. So this is why I am all in on trying to stop this banking bill. And you know, they probably have the votes in the United States Senate. Probably, but I'm not giving up. And even if it does, it'll have to go over. We'll conference with the House, probably come back for another vote. We'll see what happens. But I got to tell you, we got to have a voice. We got to get out there and fight. Because if we don't, it's going to be a government that just keeps working better and better for a thinner and thinner slice at the top and kicks dirt in everybody else's face. And I'm fighting back against that. You bet. You bet. Final question you bet. on the left. Last one. Make it a good okay. one. OK. I'll try. All uh, right. Andre Gomez from uh, Springfield. Hi, Andre. Um, so I wanted to, first of all, thank you for being here. And uh, thank you for being a leading voice in, in the fight. Your book is also a great motivational tool to uh, get into the fight. Yes. Um, so we appreciate that uh, Good. very much. I, I wanted to ask you regarding just in, in my day-to-day -day life, uh, I know that uh, my views aren't always left completely, and they're not always right completely. And you know, not always conservative, not always liberal. Um, and I know that there's places, and I respect it, where we all have to stand and say, no, we're drawing a line in the sand here, and this is, we will not move from here. But on another note, are there any areas that you see where you can say, oh, you know what? I see where I can compromise here. This is where we can both give a little bit and actually achieve something for regular Americans. You bet. And have I got a story to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm so glad you asked this, because look, there are these core things. If, if the fundamental question is, should we roll back health care for 35 million Americans or compromise and do it for only 25 million Americans, I'm not in. Because I don't believe we ought to roll back health care for anybody. But there are places we can still come together for the good of the American people. Let me tell you a quick story. 40 million people in America have hearing loss. Fewer than one in, did you say what? <laughs> Fewer than one in six gets a hearing aid that would help them. And the principal reason is because hearing aids now cost thousands of dollars. They're not covered by Medicare, they're not covered by Medicaid, and they're not covered by most insurance plans. And, and just for any of you who've never lived with someone who has hearing loss or have hearing loss yourself, it's an enormously isolating problem. You, you can't hear your family. People get to where they won't drive. They won't go to the store. Uh, uh, people who have hearing loss actually, over time, develop other medical conditions because they just, they're just much more isolated. So do you ever think about why hearing aids are so expensive? I mean, look at them. It's, look at, and I'm serious. Compare it with your phone. There's a whole lot more computing power in your phone and also a lot of audio stuff. So why are hearing aids so very expensive? And the answer is that a small number of hearing aid manufacturers basically captured 
state law to make it really hard to get a hearing aid. So you've got to walk this way, and then you've got to have somebody, and then they've got to sign off, and they've got to do this other thing, and then they've got to do this other thing, and this other thing. So I was talking to some, some scientists about some doctors, and they said, you know, it would be perfectly safe to sell hearing aids over the counter, just like you sell glasses over the counter. You could still go get expensive ones if that's what you want, but if you sold them over the counter, two things would happen. With a big market, a lot more manufacturers would get in, start innovating, and likely drop the price to just a few hundred dollars. And I said, wow, that sounds terrific. So I get it mapped out. I write the law, because this is something you could do at the federal level. You can override the state laws. And the law simply that I wrote says, you can sell hearing aids over the counter. Right? That's all this law says. So get it all written out, test it out with the scientists, talk to them, do I have this right? Do we have the right language on what we're asking for? You'll love this. So I called Chuck Grassley. Republican from Iowa, and I said, Chuck, have I got an idea? <laughs> he said, what? <laughs> and I said, you're going to love it. And I told him about this hearing aid bill, and I swear, within five minutes, he said, I'm in. Let's do this, Elizabeth. Johnny Isaacson, a Republican from Georgia, was the next one we got on board. Susan Collins, a Republican from Maine, the next one we got on board. In other words, there are places, so here was the deal. We did this under the radar screen, because yeah. yeah. <clears throat> guess what? The hearing aid industry didn't like this at all, right? <laughs> oh, and you'll love this. At one point, the NRA weighed in against it. <laughs> I kid you not. Um, uh, 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 Joe Kennedy introduced the companion bill with a Republican over in the House. Go, Joe. There was a bill that was moving through Congress, through the FDA, it was some FDA reauthorization stuff that had to, had to move. And it's that exciting moment in Congress when you see something actually is gonna move and you line up your little car and try to get hooked onto the train to move through. And two months ago, the president signed it into law. Woo! Yeah! So, it may be a year or so, maybe a little longer before the FDA gets the regs written because you have to have warnings with them. You know, if you see these kind of problems, go to a doctor and so on, and to get them out there. But already, there are companies that are now into manufacturing hearing aids. We can do things. Government can be a force for good. So, let me close. Let me close with that, actually, that very hopeful thought. You know, I stand up here today. My daddy ended up as a janitor. My mom worked a minimum wage job at Sears. That was the deal. When the time came for me to go to college, there was no money. I wanted to be a school teacher more than anything. I got a scholarship, and then, you know, a boy proposed to me. I dropped out of college. Oh, God, was I smart at 19. <laughs> and I, I fell off the track. But I grew up in an America that was not only about first chances, it was about second chances. I grew up in an America that was about building opportunity for kids like me. My chance, and the reason I'm so glad to be at STIC today, my chance was a commuter college that cost $50 a semester. That's what government can do. If we really want to invest in a future for our young people, we can invest in their education. We can make sure that anybody who's willing to work hard is going to have a chance to just get out there. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to have parents who can write a check for it. You can get out there, work hard, play by the rules, and actually have a chance to do something. But part of that comes. I used to think of that story of how a janitor's kid ended up where I ended up. And I used to think, Good on me, hard work. And yeah, that's definitely part of it. 
But it's also hard work when you grow up in an America that says, here are some opportunities and some paths going forward. I believe in that America, and I believe the only way we're going to get it is if we fight for it together. So thank you all for being here. Thank you.